Have you heard of the phrase living in a bubble? It is used to describe someone who is isolated, disconnected from reality, someone who lives in an echo chamber. It can be used to describe the Chinese state too. They live in a bubble, fed with a daily dose of communist party propaganda. It's bad enough as it is, but it's dangerous when you start buying your own propaganda. Let me give you a recent example. Two Chinese experts, two Chinese officials have given an assessment on India. They say India is no challenge for the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Army. And this is not jingoistic bombast. This is their ignorance speaking. The men who made these statements are Zhao Xiao Zhu and Zhang Qi. Both hold the position of what they call senior colonel in the Chinese military. They're members of what you can call the PLA's brain trust. They work with China's leading military universities. So what they think shapes the strategy of the Chinese army. And that's why their opinion matters. Last week, the PLA sent these officials to the Shangri-La Dialogue. This is an annual security conference. It is hosted by Singapore, and it's attended by leading defense leaders and thinkers. So these PLA officials were there, and they spoke about India and the border standoff with China. I have their statements. Senior Colonel Zhao spoke about India's defense modernization. Listen to what he said. India is unlikely to catch up to China in the coming decades because of its weak industrial infrastructure, while China has built complex and systematic defense industrial platforms. And this is what his counterpart had to say. Senior Colonel Zhang, I'm quoting again, India has spared no effort in military modernization in a bid to become an impressive superpower as other countries have done. This was their opinion. They say India is lagging in defense manufacturing and hence poses no challenge to China. If this is the foundation of the PLA's military strategy, I say it's good news for India because it just demonstrates their ignorance. You see, there's a limited connection between military modernization and war preparedness. Modernization is about enhancing your country's military capabilities. It is important, yes, but only to an extent. Being ready for war involves a lot more than just having the latest and the greatest weapons. You need many other things to fight a war, like infrastructure, strategy, training, knowing the lay of the land, understanding the weakness of your adversary, and the experience of fighting and winning wars. We know that China is woefully inadequate in this department. China hasn't fought a war in more than four decades, so while the PLA's military may be growing, its soldiers remain untested. Most of China's military arsenal has not seen any real combat. The ability of their soldiers to use their weapons is unproven. Compare that to India. Our soldiers are in better shape, they know their weapons well, and they have combat experience. Do you know what else you need to fight a war? You need a robust economy. Now, China's economy is much bigger than India, no two ways about it. But at this point, it's too fragile to handle a war. Remember what I said about living in a bubble and buying your own propaganda? Chinese strategists are doing that. Their country is struggling with a deep debt crisis. Local governments are sinking, they owe large amounts of money, and they're running out of cash. We've been telling you about this. Last month, there was a serious crisis in Kunming. Reports said a local authority was on the verge of bankruptcy. They had to, to repay $170 million, but they did not have that money. So at the 11th hour, Authorities issued new bonds. They were trying to raise more cash. And when these reports came out, local officials were quick to deny them. But one city after another is coming under stress. In Wuhan, they've started naming and shaming debtors. They've released hundreds of names to recover a sum of $42 million. Going by one estimate, local governments in China owe about $23 trillion. That's nearly twice the size of China's GDP. I'll repeat that. China's GDP is a little over $12 trillion. Local government debt is at a whopping $23 trillion. Can a country like this finance a war? And at what cost? Perhaps China's military thinkers should think about this. Is NATO coming to Asia? It's a question that many countries in the region are asking. Some say NATO is already here. They're partners in the Indo-Pacific. They're also opening an office in Japan. But what does NATO's Asian pivot mean? China is clearly unhappy about it. The defense minister made that clear at the Shangri-La Dialogue. It's an annual security conference held in Singapore, like we just told you. All major powers attend it. China's defense minister lashed out at NATO's Asian pivot. He said, 
all such alliances will plunge the region into chaos. Listen to this. In essence, attempts to push for NATO-like alliances in the Asia-Pacific are a way of kidnapping regional countries and exaggerating conflicts and confrontations, which will only plunge the Asia-Pacific into a vortex of disputes and conflicts. Which alliances is he talking about? You have security groupings like the AUKUS and the Five Eyes Alliance. You also have more dynamic ones like the Quad. China opposes all of them. It says this is an attempt to contain Beijing's influence. Just one problem, though. These alliances did not appear out of thin air. They are a direct response to Chinese expansionism. Look at the partner countries. India is a member of the Quad. Philippines recently held four-way talks with the US, Japan, and Australia. These are not Western countries. These are Asian nations fed up with Chinese belligerence. A free and open Indo-Pacific is in their interest as well. The only question is how to achieve that. Should NATO be imported into Asia? There are indications of such an attempt, not to recruit Asian members, but to create a wider community. And India figures prominently in that plan. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is in New Delhi. His visit comes weeks ahead of Prime Minister Modi's U.S. trip. He's already met Defense Minister Rajnath Singh. Security cooperation topped the agenda. Talks are on to share fighter jet engine technology with India. New Delhi is also planning to buy 30 drones from the U.S. The deal is worth around $3 billion. It is consistent with India's long-term defense policy. Diversify purchases, build up local capabilities. But the U.S. has something even bigger in mind. This is NATO Plus. Now, some quick facts. NATO Plus is an extended community of NATO. Right now, there are five members, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Israel, and New Zealand. How is this different from NATO? For starters, these countries are not Atlantic. They're Indo-Pacific and West Asian. But more importantly, there is no Article 5. Article 5 is the rule of collective defense. It does not apply to NATO+. Plus, and it's honestly a raw deal. You get all the responsibilities, but none of the protection. Then why bother joining it? NATO Plus offers easy intelligence sharing. It will also make military procurement easier. Say you want an American F-16 or an F-22. If you're part of NATO Plus, you could get a good deal. A U.S. House panel wants India to be included in this setup, in NATO Plus. It's a panel that deals with China. It has the support of both Democrats and Republicans. But how should India see this offer? With a lot of apprehension. NATO plus may not be a treaty alliance, but it's a clear sign of picking sides. If India joins NATO plus, it would limit New Delhi's strategic autonomy. No more warm ties with Russia. Definitely no defense trade. Plus, India's relationship with the U.S. is very different from other NATO plus members. Australia and New Zealand fought two world wars on America's side. Japan and South Korea are treaty allies. Israel and the U.S. share a special relationship. But India-U.S. ties are very different from all of these. These warm exchanges are a recent phenomenon. Washington spent most of the last 70 years criticizing and sanctioning India, so New Delhi must be wary. It cannot become a pawn for NATO's new rivalry with China. The alliance is famous for its use and throw tactics. So the China challenge must be met on India's terms, which means no to alliance and yes to engagement. Even the U.S. seems to be testing the waters right now. This NATO plus idea was proposed by a U.S. panel. It has not been officially offered by the U.S. government. Seems like Washington was sending out feelers trying to see what the reaction will be. So far, it's been tepid. NATO plus comes with a lot of baggage, commitments and demands. India would do well to steer clear. Now let's turn our attention to Afghanistan. Almost 80 schoolgirls, 80, 80 schoolgirls there have been poisoned. This happened over the weekend in the Sarepol province in northern Afghanistan. Two schools were targeted. 60 girls were poisoned in the first school, 17 in the second. The girls were primary school students from classes 1 to 6. The authorities claim that all these girls were rushed to hospital and that they're all fine now. But very few details have been given. No confirmation about the poison use, no word on how the attackers managed to poison these girls, no details about the injuries that the girls have sustained. And it's only girls. The authorities just said that they are now in quote-unquote good condition. We do hope they are. But what's happened is alarming. Who is targeting Afghan schoolgirls? 
The authorities say this is a case of a personal grudge and that the suspect allegedly paid a third party to carry out these attacks. This is an initial report based on the investigation by the Provincial Education Department. And this is all that they're willing to share for the moment. The department officials have not been too forthcoming. This is not the first time or the first incident of poisoning in Afghanistan, but this is the first since the Taliban took power in 2021. In the last two years, they have systematically attacked women's education. They're not allowed to study or work. Education for girls is allowed only up to the age of 12. After that, they're barred from school and college. And after what happened over the weekend, it seems even children are not safe in schools. School poisonings are a preferred modus operandi of hardliners. Look at neighboring Iran. It has become a regular occurrence in Iran. The first reports came last November. School girls were poisoned in the city of Qom. It's a holy city and it made news for all the wrong reasons. Since then, more than 1,000 Iranian school girls have been poisoned. None of the children reportedly died, but that may not have been the intention. Let me quote from the UN Human Rights Office report in March. This is what it says. Many parents have removed their daughters from school for fear of these attacks. The United States also weighed in on the matter. This is what they said. Women and girls everywhere have a fundamental right to education. Time and time again, it has been demonstrated that when women and girls receive an education and are able to contribute to their economies, it benefits society as a whole. So the possibility that girls in Iran are being possibly poisoned simply for trying to get an education is, uh, is, is shameful and it's uh, unacceptable. And uh, our thoughts remain with the victims of, and their families. Both seem to imply that the attacks were about one thing, stopping girls from receiving an education. But since then, the world seems to have moved on. And the school girls keep facing attacks. The poisonings in Iran have not stopped completely. Reports keep popping up from time to time, which means that school girls keep getting pulled out of school. And now the trend has crossed the border and returned to Afghanistan. It seems like an insidious plot to stop the education of women, to relegate them to the background, and the world doesn't seem to care enough. Every time this kind of news comes out, there's a loud reaction, but no action. There are appeals to conduct a fair investigation, catch the people responsible. But where's the follow-up? Without concrete action, these attacks will continue. They'll also spread. Once people see that no one is stopping them, they will continue poisoning schoolgirls with impunity, and this has to stop. Everyone loves a good surprise, maybe a nice birthday party or a gift, but surprises are best left to our personal lives. In geopolitics, the premium is on stability and predictability. Boring, but necessary. But Saudi Arabia missed the memo. This weekend, the kingdom decided to slash oil output. They will produce one million fewer barrels in July. But that's not the full story. Saudi Arabia is going solo here. The oil cartel, OPEC Plus, has stuck to its previous cuts. They're not increasing cuts. Only Saudi Arabia has announced new cuts. Listen in to their energy minister. As we have done in April, whereby uh, the countries that had uh, agreed to uh, do the voluntary cuts uh, have extended that voluntary cuts to end of 24, and uh, I would have to call it the Saudi lollipop, which is a million barrel of reduction uh, for the start that starts at the 1st of July. And it, that million is also extendable. Interesting choice of words. Oil is arguably the most important commodity of our times. Dropping surprise bombs in that market is certainly not a Saudi lollipop, as he puts it. So why is Riyadh doing it? To proper prices. In the months after Russia's invasion, oil was booming. Let's look at Brent crude. It's an oil index. In June 2022, Brent crude was $112. That's $112 per barrel. And now... $76 per barrel. It had fallen to nearly $70 by late May. Now that's bad news for the Saudi Kingdom. Around 50% of their economy is built on oil. So what do they do? They reduce oil production to boost prices. It's economics 101. There are two ways to increase prices. You either boost the demand or you reduce the supply. Saudi Arabia went for the latter. They reduce the supply. They need higher prices to fund their grand diversification plans. 
But how high? The International Monetary Fund says $80 per barrel. That's what they need. At that price, Riyadh will be comfortable. But why isn't that happening? Why is that, that rise not happening organically? Because the global economy is not growing fast enough. Look at any industry. Travel has not reached pre-pandemic levels. Neither has factory output. So the demand for oil continues to be stagnant. Prices are not racing towards $100 a barrel. They're falling towards 70 Hence the surprise announcement by Saudi Arabia. But there's a flip side to it. Higher oil prices can fuel inflation. That's what happened in 2022. Central banks have been raising interest rates to keep prices under control. They were just about to hit the pause button. But if oil rallies again, all bets are off. So what scenarios are we looking at? The most optimistic one is this. There is a grand economic recovery in the second half of this year. Factory production rises, people start flying again, so the demand for oil rises organically. That would bring stability to the market. If not, there could be trouble. Rising oil prices will worsen the cost of living crisis. How is India placed to tackle this problem? Well, there is some good news. We're not as dependent on Saudi Arabia. Around 40% of India's oil, oil imports, now come from Russia. That's more than Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Iraq combined. And since Russia has not announced any cuts yet, the impact on India will be limited. Having said that, it's not all rosy. 85% of India's oil is imported. New Delhi is ultimately at OPEC's mercy like all non-oil producers. It's a major drawback of the global system, one so-called lollipop, and you pay extra at the pump. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story, starting with India. An under-construction bridge collapsed in the state of Bihar. This particular bridge collapsed for the second time in 14 months. In Indonesia, worshippers climbed to the top of an active volcano to perform a religious ceremony. And June is... The Pride Month. In Thailand, members of the LGBTQ community held a Pride Parade in Bangkok. And finally, what makes the 5th of June significant? We're taking you back in history. On this day in 1967, a six-day war began in West Asia. This war was fought between Israel and Arab states, the states of Egypt, Jordan and Syria. The brief but bloody battle was a result of years of diplomatic friction. The war ended with a UN-brokered ceasefire, but it changed the map of West Asia. Leaving you with that, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
email exchanges from inside the BBC. They talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colonist.